committee will come back to order. Um, we will now recognize our second panel. Mr. Timothy Massad is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability at the U.S. Treasury. In his capacity, Mr. Massad heads the Office of Financial Stability, which administers TARP. Prior to joining Treasury, uh, Mr. Massad was a partner with a New York law firm which had a diverse corporate practice. Thank you for being here today. It is the policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn in uh, before they testify. If you will please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. you may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. So with that, Mr. Massey, we will recognize you for five minutes, and uh, your written testimony will be entered into the record. We will then have some questions from the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. You have invited me here to address whether the perception that some institutions are too big to fail persists despite the passage of Dodd-Frank, and I am happy to do so. I am also pleased to be following Special Inspector General for TARP Neil Borofsky on his last day in office. SIGTARP's recent quarterly report suggests that TARP's most significant legacy may be the moral hazard associated with too-big-to-fail institutions, and I am happy to address that statement as well. Moral hazard is a real and significant concern, but to suggest that this is TARP's main legacy confuses a response to a crisis with the need to fix the flaws in our regulatory system that helped trigger the crisis. TARP was necessary and it did what it was supposed to do. Its most significant legacy is that it, combined with other government actions, helped save our economy from a catastrophic collapse and may have helped prevent a second Great Depression. The lesson we learned from having to take these actions was that to better protect ourselves against future crises and to deal with the moral hazard issue, our regulatory system needed to be fixed. Today, while more work remains, we have taken significant action to do just that. In particular, we have taken steps to address the moral hazard associated with the fact that, other, that TARP and other government interventions were necessary and to address the too-big-to-fail problem. Just 19 months after TARP was enacted, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act the most comprehensive reform of our, regulatory, of our financial regulatory system since the 1930s. Dodd-Frank contains three main elements that work together to address the too-big-to-fail problem in particular. First and most important, Dodd-Frank gives the government authority to shut down and break apart large non-bank financial firms whose imminent failure might threaten the broader system. It does so in a way that protects the economy while ensuring that large financial firms and not taxpayers bear the cost. Dodd-Frank provides us with the tools to ensure that no firm will be insulated from the consequences of its actions or protected from failure. Dodd-Frank makes clear that tax taxpayers must not be asked to bear the costs of a financial firm's failure. Second, Dodd-Frank creates a framework for identifying and responding to risk in the financial system. It creates the Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC, and the Office of Financial Research, the OFR. FSOC is charged with identifying risks to financial stability, responding to any emerging systemic threats, and promoting market discipline. OFR supports this task by addressing the critical need for more standardized, more useful, and more reliable data. Third, Dodd-Frank requires regulators to impose substantially stronger prudential standards. Risk-based capital, leverage, and liquidity standards will be tougher. Bigger and more complex firms will have to hold more capital than smaller and less complex firms. Dodd-Frank also requires that certain large firms undergo regular stress tests and requires living wills. It also restricts risky activities by banks, such as proprietary trading, as well as the excessive growth by acquisition of the very largest firms. Dodd-Frank sets a clear path forward. We have made important progress since enactment to implement its provisions, but there is a lot more work to do. The financial markets are closely watching this progress, which underscores the importance of the implementation. Of course, I'm sorry. Let me, let me turn briefly back to TARP, because another piece of restoring a strong financial system is unwinding the extraordinary assistance that had to be provided during the crisis. Since I last appeared before the full committee, TARP has continued to make good progress. 
we have moved quickly to reduce the dependence of the financial system on the emergency support provided. I am happy to note that as this hearing is taking place, we expect to receive an additional $7.4 billion in repayments from banks. This means that taxpayers will have recovered more than 100 percent of the funds invested in the banking system, that is, $251 billion compared to the $245 billion invested. Every additional dollar we recover from now on will be a net gain to the taxpayer. And with today's repayments, over 70 percent of the total amount dispersed under TARP has been recovered. The ultimate cost of TARP will be far less than anyone expected. Earlier this month, the CBO estimated the overall cost to be approximately $19 billion. Of course, TARP was only one part of the actions taken by the government to respond to this crisis, which also included support for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the Federal Reserve's actions to, to provide credit and guarantees of money market funds and bank debt. And it is important to look also at the cost of all of these measures. Our latest estimate of the direct fiscal cost of these interventions, which will be made available shortly, will show that there actually should be a small profit when we look at all those actions combined. Now, this estimate does not include the stimulus measures, and it doesn't include the significant cost to our economy of this crisis. Jobs were lost, businesses failed, household wealth declined, and tax revenues fell. But that damage would have been far worse without the government's emergency response. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I welcome your questions, and let me just say I am also happy to respond to any of the uh, matters that Mr. Borofsky raised, whether it is pertaining to Dodd-Frank or other issues. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes. <clears throat> there are a number of questions uh, that uh, Dodd-Frank raises. Now, I certainly read your editorial uh, against my legislation ending the HAMP program. We don't have to relitigate that. We won the vote last night, so I'm, I'm fine with that, obviously. Um, and we had a bipartisan vote as well. And I hope that sends a strong message to the overseer of that program, you, Mr. Massett, and your staff, that uh, the status quo there is simply not acceptable. Uh, destroying 800,000 people's credits, uh, credit scores. Uh, taking their savings um, is, is not a responsible program in order to help a half a million people. Um, and the people that are brought into the program given verbal uh, modifications of their mortgages and yet are kicked out of the program at the end, at the end of the day. At your recent report, that number is about was 740,240. Uh, and, and we appreciate you releasing those numbers, but it is simply not acceptable. But we don't have to relitigate that because I was happy to win the vote. Now, I, I want to I raise a question that, that I think is um, interesting. You, you said the taxpayers won't be on the hook uh, for, your, for future bailouts. Uh, can you explain how, how you justify that under Dodd Frank? Dodd Frank provides that taxpayers will not fund any bailout. What it provides is it gives the authority. How does it provide that? Gives the authority to the FDIC to liquidate a non-bank financial firm that is threatening the system, and to impose those costs on creditors and shareholders, including the ability to claw back those costs, and to the extent those costs can't be imposed on creditors and shareholders, then there is an assessment after the fact on large financial institutions. Okay. And so, uh, so you disagree with Mr. Borofsky's assertion that Dodd-Frank and uh, your boss, the Treasury Secretary's uh, comment that uh, in the event of the next crisis, we would have to do extraordinary things beyond the scope of the Dodd-Frank legislation. Uh, as I have testified before, Mr. Chairman, the Secretary's statement referred to the fact that it is difficult to predict the shape, the nature of a crisis, and you may have to take extraordinary actions, but he was referring to using the tools of Dodd-Frank. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So another question I have is, um, is Treasury, in terms of looking at financial stability, are you looking at the interconnectedness of our financial markets across uh, regulatory regimes, meaning um, uh, foreign regulations? Um, and how they are moving forward. 
Uh, is there going to be, uh, I, speaking to market participants, I think they see a, an opportunity for regulatory arbitrage and to make money based on the fact that other uh, European countries, for instance, are, are behind us in terms of changing their uh, financial regulations. Is, is this a concern to you? Oh, absolutely, uh, Mr. Chairman. It is a very good question. Thank you for raising it. One of the important things we have to do is to work with uh, foreign regulators to try to Are you to doing that? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. There is a lot of work going on by Treasury, by the Fed, by others to do that. The Dodd-Frank uh, law provides for that. Well, I know it provides for that. I am asking you the question of how that is going. Is that, is that progressing? I and how is it progressing? What are you doing? Uh, there is a lot of work going on by each agency, uh, Mr. Chairman. As you know, I know that there is a lot of work going on by each agency. I mean, you are stating some very obvious things. I understand it is part of the Treasury tact here, and I have seen you in committees before, is to not answer questions. Well, I am the chairman of this committee. I call my own time, so you need to answer the question. Mr. Chairman, I will be happy to provide you with details about that. I do not have them at my fingertips. It is not my responsibility to coordinate with our international friends on those regulatory regimes. It is my responsibility to implement the TARP program. But I would be very happy to get you a detailed response on that. Okay. So uh, financial stability is, it doesn't entail looking at international uh, regulatory regimes, is, is, is what I am trying to understand from you. I will move on. I will move on. It is fine. So the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is uh, a creation of Dodd-Frank, uh, entails a number of regulators sitting on a council together, uh, and I understand that. Now, and each regulator has their own staff. Uh, is it your view, is it uh, in terms of you know, pre preparing for this um, and how this council will actually operate? Um, how their, their meetings will occur, where they will occur. Is this largely being driven by the Treasury Department? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the FSOC is chaired by the Secretary of the Treasury. It has a number of members, as you know, 10 voting members as well as non-voting members. It meets periodically. It is developing staff. It is promulgating rules. Uh, so there uh, is a lot of activity there. Um, and it requires the coordination across all agencies, as you know. If I may also, though, respond, I don't believe I said that financial stability doesn't entail looking at international regimes. I think I said the contrary, sir. And again, I would be happy to get you details on what is going on in that regard. Well, you said it wasn't your responsibility. That is correct. It is not. My responsibility is the TARP program. Right. And so, okay, fantastic. Great. So uh, with that, I recognize Mr. Quigley for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask. Um, good morning. Good morning. Um, questions this morning uh, were brought up earlier about uh, community banks hmm. and the relative disadvantage. That are you in a position to talk about the comparative disadvantage many of those banks, many of them in my state, uh, are at at this point, and what can be done? Congressman, that is a very important question. I would be happy to talk about that. We obviously have to have a, a thriving community bank uh, sector in this country. We have taken a number of actions under the TARP program to do that. We funded the Obama administration did not provide any funds to large banks. We provided uh, funds to about 400 small banks, and about 650 small banks were funded under the program. The Treasury also pushed for the implementation of the Small Business Lending Fund to provide additional assistance to those banks. Uh, the differential you have referred to is, is important, and I think, once again, Dodd-Frank provides us with some tools to address that. It allows us to impose tougher standards on the largest banks, capital standards, leverage standards, liquidity standards. Now, again, there is a lot of work to be done to implement that, but I think it does give us some tools to address that very problem. Uh, there is still, you would talk, you could, uh mention at least some of the differences that still exist that need to be addressed. Could you detail some of those? Sure. Well, the basic problem, of course, is a lot of our small banks don't have access to the capital markets. Uh, that is why, of course, we have been able to 
see that a lot of the larger banks have repaid TARP funds, many of the smaller banks have not, because it is more difficult for them to raise, uh, to raise money to do so. But we are continuing to work with them. Uh, the capital under TARP uh, is, uh, does not, is not required to be repaid at any time. And I think, again, the fact that we funded uh, a lot of those banks has helped them weather this storm. The perception in my State is that, um, as simplistic as it sounds, you have know, bailed out the big banks and shut down the small ones. You know, if you are in my position, how do you respond to those banks? Uh, it is a very good question, Congressman. I think, I think what we say is that, in fact, under TARP, particularly under President Obama, we provided capital to any small bank that was viable. And we ended up providing that to, as I say, overall in the TARP program, about 650 banks. Um, and we are continuing to work with them. Now, the, the issues you have raised as to whether big banks have an advantage, again, I think the Dodd-Frank Act is meant to provide us with tools to level the playing field. It needs to be fully implemented. Longer discussion at some other point. Let me shift gears just for a few minutes. Um, March 21st of this year, Forbes reports that uh, Goldman Sachs and others are skirting the Volcker rule by saying that it doesn't apply to long-term principal investments. What has Treasury's reaction to that been? Uh, Congressman, I'm not familiar with the particulars of implementing the Volcker rule. I'd be happy to get you a response on that. Okay. Thank you. I uh, yield back. I'm trying to figure out how to work this chair. This is not an <clears throat> a time to uh, to be before our committee, and and um, you had identified at the outset of your comments that one of the things that you would do is to try to be responsive to any comments that were made by the uh, the gentleman who testified before you. He raised an issue, which was a question that I think your general counsel was looking at, the right to conduct an audit of the exit of banks from TARP. Is there any reason why that should be a question? And what is your position as to uh, the authority of the Inspector General uh, to audit that particular process? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, it is a very good question. Uh, I believe that issue goes to whether SIGTARP or the Treasury Inspector General has jurisdiction or what each of their jurisdiction is. Uh, that is the issue. In my capacity, I respect that both are entitled to their opinions, and I defer to the judgment of uh, the General Counsel as to the proper jurisdiction between them, and that is what is going on. Okay. Well, you have a willingness on the part of SIGTARP to engage in this particular activity if, if it is determined that the Inspector General from Treasury is, is the entity by you. Are we assured that the Inspector General from Treasury would conduct that same audit? Well, again, it is not, it's not my determination. It is a question of interpreting what the law requires and provides for, right. both as to the Small Business Lending Fund law as well as TARP. And uh, I, I would say that I think both the Special Inspector General's Office and the Inspector General's Office are very, very uh, excellent uh, operations that have conducted uh, thorough audits, and I would be happy to, uh, to work with both of them as we have. Right. Well, thank you. Well, then I understand that's sort of that's a little issue that'll have to be resolved, but it'll give us a chance and to follow that. And I thank you for your observation because I didn't understand why there would have been uh, any reluctance. Um, as we look at the larger question of not just where we've been with TARP, because there's a lot of analysis and information on both sides, much of it credible about the successes of TARP. Uh, but there is a real issue about where we are going. And part of the problem has been, I think, in some ways, the unintended consequences or presumably unintended consequences with the bigger banks getting bigger. As my colleague, Mr. Quigley, said, a lot of the oversight going towards the, the institutions that perhaps were not really the target of this initial uh, effort. And what I am concerned about is the perception that now we have rating agencies that are factoring in the likelihood that somebody is going to step in to cover these banks as 
a, you know, in shoring up their position. Uh, so I am I, I'm dramatically concerned about the consequences, as, as Mr. Bernanke said, you know, sort of it creates almost limited market, it, it limits the market discipline in this kind of a context. So how do we check the ability to be assured that we aren't going to see this again? And one of the factors that I see that you have been looking at has been the idea of the living will. Mm -hmm. Now, what is going to happen in practice with that living will? Are we enforcing this and are we requiring that a real effort be made to, to, to compel uh, these organizations to explain how they are going to get out of it? Absolutely, Congressman. It is a very good question. And I was rather surprised by Mr. Borofsky's comment that somehow Treasury was opposed to this. It is a requirement of Dodd-Frank. Implementation of living wills is left to the FDIC and the Federal Reserve. They are working on it. They have until January 2012. But it was, it was part of the original proposal that Treasury made, and we have uh, we've backed the concept the entire time. But you are absolutely right that that is a, a critical tool, and how thoroughly that is enforced, I think, and how, how uh, thorough those plans are will we'll make a critical difference. Let me just add also in terms of the rating agencies, they are obviously watching this very closely as well. They should. But I think, again, uh, they have made it clear that what they are doing is monitoring it. They are seeing how we develop uh, But they are factoring in. I mean, they are not just Absolutely. monitoring. They are making, making calculations. And the calculations they are making is that we are rating these banks, giving them a preferential position with respect to the rest of the market based on their confidence that effectively somebody else is going to step in. That, that is correct. And they are doing that worldwide. But they have also said we are closely monitoring the situation to see how these resolution regimes are implemented and to see if there is the political will to, to uh, ensure that there aren't bailouts in the future. What would that political will take? As a, what, what, what should be requiring of them sure. in order for them to be able to pass the scrutiny of that living will analysis? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, I think we are at the early stage of the implementation. This law was passed eight months ago. And to sort of say it is not going to work, it, you know, it is a bit like saying when we passed the Securities Act in 1933, the Securities Exchange Act, that, well, because they didn't fix our markets uh, within six months, they didn't work. In fact, we set up the SEC. We took a lot of actions. We now have the most vibrant, robust capital markets in the world. It is the same thing as saying, well, we passed the Civil Rights Act and it didn't end discrimination overnight. It, there is some time needed to implement these things. We are busy working on it. It involves many, many agencies, not just Treasury. And I welcome Mr. Borofsky's suggestions, if he has suggestions on how to implement it, uh, but I haven't heard any specifics. Thank you, Mr. Massad. At this point in time, I turn to the uh, gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask you this, um, Mr. Massad. You heard the testimony of uh, Mr. Borofsky, did you not? Yes, I did. And um, when you were here before us before, you talked about, you said that there was going to be some retooling. And basically, if you were to, if I were to sum up, that is with regard to the AMP program, if I were to sum up what Mr. Borofsky said with regard to the AMP program and your retooling, is that uh, it may, it's a little late, but at least you're, it seems like you're aiming in the right direction, but it seem, he doesn't seem to have a lot of confidence based on the past that your department is going to do very much of anything, uh, even, even under the uh, threat of demise of the program. Uh, and I am just wondering, what is your reaction to that? Uh, certainly, Congressman. Thank you for the question. I, I, I guess my reaction was, once again, to be a little puzzled. I, I felt like there was strong criticism, but I, I didn't hear a whole lot of specifics. Um, you know, SIGTARP has made uh, about 18 recommendations to us on the HAMP program. We have implemented 14 of those. The, the, the ones we didn't implement basically would have made it harder for people to get assistance. They would have required us to thumbprint anyone. They would have required more documentation about income, comparing their, doc their income today to when they got their mortgage. 
and other things like that. And the last recommendation, specific recommendation we got was uh, in April of last year. Mm. Now, lately he said, you know, the program is a failure, um, but again, we haven't seen anything specific. We made an announcement yesterday that we are expanding our compliance reporting and we will withhold incentives. Again, on that, you know, what we did from the outset was we had a very uh, strong compliance program to try to get servicers to fix the problem. There wasn't, frankly, we, we, we only pay money when they actually enter into the permanent modification. They weren't entering into the permanent modification, which is why we focused on remedial actions initially. But you understand there is a lot of frustration on I both do. sides of the aisle. And the, and the question is, is what can we do past the conversation to really affect more people? Is there mm -hmm. something that we need to do differently? And I am, for one, and I know many of my colleagues, uh, voted against the bill yesterday to end the HAMP program. But, me, but most of us said to ourselves and to each other that Treasury has got to do better. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just real. And so I just, I'm just wondering, what do you, what's going to happen? We can't keep going down this road to where we're going because there are a lot of people suffering. And with all of that money out there, I think it just gives the opposition more ammunition to not only um, destroy the program, but also not replace it with anything. And that goes against everything that we are trying to accomplish. So I just want to know what your reaction is to that. Well, you are absolutely right that, that those people who want to end the program have not offered any alternative. Um, we continue to, to look at ways that we can improve it, but um, it is a very difficult issue. We have a lot of people who have spent a lot of time on this. And believe me, if, if there was a silver bullet, if Mr. Borofsky knows of a silver bullet, he certainly hasn't told us, uh, it is not easy. At the same time, the program is continuing to help tens of thousands. It is affecting people indirectly through the standards that we are setting. We are separately do we, do we need to raise the standards? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we need national servicing standards, and there is a lot of activity going on in that regard, as you know, uh, both through the, uh, the discussions on the foreclosure problems and otherwise. And I think we will we'll see that coming. We are very committed to that. So, um, and we have also met with members of Congress about specific things that need to be in those uh, national servicing standards. One of the things that Mr. Borowski said, too, with regard to too big to fail, he said that the in Dodd Frank there are the tools that there, and I think you agree with that. But he said that he does not believe that the administration has the will to to really carry it out. And I want you to comment on that. But I also want you to comment on this other uh, issue that I brought up, and that is that if we uh, take substantial funds away from your budget, how would that affect that uh, and that market perception that he talked about so much? Uh, Congressman, I agree 100 percent that taking away funds from implementation at this time, whether it is Treasury, SEC, FDIC, CFTC, because they all have responsibilities here, would not be a good thing. We, we need to make sure we vigorously enforce this. As to Mr. Borofsky's comment, I, again, I don't know what specifics he is referring to. The implementation process is an open one. There are, there are a number of rulemaking proceedings going on. If he has comments on those, he can make them. If he thinks that uh, certain things aren't happening fast enough, he should, he should point that out. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, Mr. Cummings. At this point, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Massad, for being here this morning and your willingness to testify. I um, am looking at your opening statement, and I just wondered if we could flesh out a couple of uh, items that are in your comments here this morning. Uh, in reference to Dodd-Frank, and you, you listed three points for us. The first one is Dodd-Frank gives the government the authority to shut down and break apart large, um, I guess I have to put my glasses on, non-bank financial firms. To what extent and what is the scope of that? And should we be concerned that the government has that kind of power, that they can just 
uh, shut down a, a private entity? Uh, it is a good question, Congresswoman. There, there is a process that has to go on. There is a determination that has to be made uh, by the Treasury in, uh, with also the vote of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve and in consultation with the President. And there are criteria that have to be met in order to do that in terms of when you can use that authority. Uh, those criteria include that there is not another way to deal with the situation, that the firm, in fact, does pose a threat uh, to our financial stability, and there are others. And again, there is rulemaking going on to, to further explicate that, because it is important for there to be uh, clarity uh, as to those rules. Thank you. Um, and, and I guess the second point for identifying and responding to risk, I think that would tie back to the first point. Are there certain uh, benchmarks that you are going to look for or what that will identify that, that someone is in trouble, that then the no government needs to take this aggressive action? Sure. And again, there are, there are standards in the law that now have to be implemented and fleshed out more. But, you know, I think the key thing to remember here is that prior to the passage of Dodd-Frank, we, we regulated entities based on the type of entity, and we didn't have a comprehensive way of looking at risk to the system. And that is what we have now, and that is why this, this law is so important, and that is why implementation of it is so important. And we can take, we can take proactive measures to impose uh, prudential standards, whether it be capital, leverage, liquidity. We can limit risky activities. And there is a whole process where even before you exercise the, the liquidation authority, you can impose restraints on firms. So it gives us a lot of tools. But again, uh, they need to be implemented. I guess going along with that um, gives you the tools. And at what point, what is the concern that the government, many feel, Dodd Frank, and that it is an overreach? And while we always we want to prevent what happened, uh, the meltdown, we, we want to still maintain free market. And so at what point does the government step back and say, we are not going to get involved? Sure. Well, obviously there is a balance there. I think Congress struck the right balance in, in the Dodd-Frank Act in giving us those tools. But the, you know, the, the answer to your question really gets into the details of how it is implemented. And that is why, again, it has to be implemented uh, thoughtfully uh, uh, over time. And that may change over time. As our, as our financial industry changes, we are going to have to change how we look at it and how we think about uh, risk. And then just one more question regarding your testimony. Uh, you talk about Dodd-Frank, you say, but much work remains to be done. And can you just expand on that briefly? Certainly. Uh, there are about 250 rulemakings that have to happen. There are about 70 studies, one-time studies that have to happen. It involves efforts of many agencies, uh, not just the Treasury, not just the FDIC, but also the Federal Reserve the SEC, the CFTC, and others. And so that is the work I am referring to. A number of those things are, are, uh, have already been done or are in process. A number of proposed rules are out there. But there is a lot more work to be done. Thank you. In my few seconds that are remaining here, I just have one last question. I mean, the government now is a player and a referee. And do you see an, a conflict in all of this? Well, I don't, I don't think we want to want the government to be a player in the sense of having interests in firms. That is why we are trying to unwind the TARP program so quickly, for example, and get out of the business of owning stakes in private companies. And as I said, we have been very, very successful in doing that quickly. I think the government needs to stick to its role of regulating risk and monitoring risk and taking action when firms pose risks to the system. But clearly, we have to have a system where there is no firm that is, that is too big to fail and that firms fail as a result of uh, the actions they take. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bergel. And the Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Mrs. Maloney. Thank you, and, and welcome to the committee again. Um, Thank you. During the financial crisis, uh, some firms became uh, so ris risky, they were so risky and so interconnected that their failure was a, a threat to the broader economy. 
And I, I know uh, Congress tried to address that in Treasury in Dodd-Frank. Uh, can you describe the progress being made under the authority granted under Dodd-Frank to prevent companies from becoming so interconnected and so risky that they could be a danger to the broader economy? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes. Thank you for the question. Um, there are a number of efforts going on in that regard, looking at uh, the riskiness of activities. Um, for example, the FSOC will make determinations about which firms pose those sorts of risks based on not just their size, but also their interconnectedness, their leverage, the nature of their activities. And that work is ongoing. Those determinations haven't been made yet. Uh, they will be made by the FSOC, which, as uh, I noted earlier, is comprised of all these various agencies. Thank you. One of the factors that led to the, the financial crisis was the evolution of what we call the shadow banking system, uh, where the purchase, sale and trading of derivatives had grown to uh, be a trillion-dollar business, but it became very evident during the crisis that uh, people, Treasury, even the companies didn't, did not understand the scope, location of the risk, uh, the size of it. Uh, I can recall AIG coming before this committee saying the threat was only 50 million, and then later it became billions and billions and billions uh, coming. Uh, it, there was no control, no understanding of even the location, the size. Uh, can, you, can you comment on uh, what advances you have made on the derivative market and bring it into the light of day to ensure that it can exist without posing a threat to um, financial stability? Certainly, uh, Congresswoman. As you know, Dodd-Frank does provide provisions uh, for uh, greater transparency and regulation of the derivatives market, and we did not have those uh, previously. And there is a lot of work going on in that regard. Now, can, that, can you specify the, uh, the Congresswoman, I am not directly involved in that work. Again, I would be happy to get back right. to you. That involves uh, Treasury, but also the, the, the SEC, the CFTC. So, but I would be happy to arrange right. that for you. And, and the growth of the, the shadow banking system also illustrates the fact that Federal regulators had in many ways failed to keep up with uh, market innovations. And, and developments. Uh, regulation couldn't keep up with the innovation and, and dynamic action taking place in the markets. Uh, uh, can you ensure us that Dodd-Frank and the regulations that you put in place are going to be able to keep pace with innovations in the financial markets? Uh, it's a very good question. And, and again, what Dodd-Frank does is give us the tools to do that. We have to implement them. Uh, but previously, we didn't have a system where we could look at risk across our entire system. We regulated banks. We had certain regulation of other type of entities. But as, we, as you have noted, we had an entire shadow banking system developed. We had all this risk being uh, taken on by firms that weren't subject to regulation. AIG is a classic example. Uh, there was no Federal regulation, uh, effectively, of AIG. And it did engage in these derivatives that were terribly destructive. Now, as to AIG, for example, we have now wound that down. That is part of the reason why uh, uh, they are going to be able to repay the government uh, every dollar that we gave them. That is good news. Earlier, uh, we heard testimony from Special Inspector General um, Barofsky. And one of the points that he raised and has raised is that the Act does not reach far enough to fully address international firms that operate globally. And we are in a global economy, a global uh, market. Are U.S. regulators working with their fa foreign counterparts to address the issue of cross-border uh, resolution authority? And are our financial institutions at a competitive disadvantage because we have regulation, yet many of these other areas in the financial global market do not? They don't have the capital requirements. They don't have the, the risk uh, restraints. They don't have the oversight that uh, American firms will be having. The, the uh, Congresswoman, thank you for that. The, 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 the international coordination piece of this is very critical. We are dealing in a global world. We have these large institutions who aren't just national institutions. They operate uh, worldwide. 
And that is why that coordination is important. It is going on. I know the, the Federal Reserve is involved in that. The Treasury is involved in that. I would be happy to get you more details on uh, what is taking place in that regard. But obviously, Congress couldn't legislate uh, something that mandates what uh, our foreign counterparties do, but it, it requires us to engage in uh, cooperation and coordination with them. Well, the, the Basel talks, uh, where do they stand? They, they are going to have international capital requirements. They uh, will. But, and where does that stand now? That, that is right, and that will result in, in higher capital requirements that will be phased in over time that are badly needed. Uh, fortunately, our, uh, many of our institutions are better capitalized today than their, than their foreign counterparts, but we need to see, we need to phase in those, those tougher standards. Well, my time has expired, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Let me turn now to the, uh, the gentleman from Illinois. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Mr. Massad, thank you for uh, your uh, testimony today. L let me ask you a, a, just a, a brief question or two uh, related to the insurance industry. Um, I have heard from a number of people uh, of late who have expressed concerns with how Dodd-Frank has and will affect the insurance industry. You know that insur insurers are already heavily regulated at the State level, including an industry-funded State guarantee system that helps secure policyholders in the event of an insurance company failure. Most insurers are not engaged in significant, unregulated, interconnected, off-balance sheet, highly leveraged activities. And so designations such as system, systemically important would appear to be unwarranted in this industry. Uh, overlapping and conflicting rules between State and Federal regulators adds an additional costly layer of regulation that would significantly disadvantage these insurers and their customers. As you know, in the event of another large financial company failure, Companies with assets over $50 billion could be on the hook to pay for the resolution of these failed firms, even though they exhibited no bad behavior of their own. Insurance companies who, according to the Dodd-Frank Act, will continue to be resolved in the existing State system are never resolved by the orderly liquidation process and yet have to pay to resolve banks and other bad actors in the financial industry. Uh, these costs will inevitably be borne by the consumer. So if, if insurance companies are, are already regulated at the State level, and if it is clear that they don't participate in systemically risky behavior, uh, why do they have to bail out other failing financial service companies that do participate in this risky behavior? Congressman, <clears throat> excuse me. Your, your question raises a number of very, very important issues. Um, let me try my best. Um, I guess where I would start is that we have come out of a period where, in fact, we did have a very large insurance company that was regulated at the State level, but which posed huge risks to our system because it wasn't regulated uh, beyond that, and that was AIG. And we didn't have the tools uh, to deal with it. And its uh, potential failure uh, could have brought down our entire system. So obviously that has uh, animated uh, the, uh, the provisions of Dodd-Frank uh, that in part you know, address the insurance industry. But I recognize your point that we have to make sure that these provisions are implemented in a way which is fair to those companies that don't pose those risks and that don't engage in those activities. Um, I think that is a process that uh, uh, we have to focus on as we go forward. The FSOC uh, is very focused on those sorts of issues because we, we, again, need to do this in a way that imposes standards and restrictions on those firms that pose the significant risks to the system while at the same time level the playing field uh, for, the, for the others. And you would acknowledge, though, that with regard to AIG, it, it wasn't their insurance business that, that in, in, in effect, got them in trouble or brought them down? Uh, well, that's, it's a complicated question. There were things <clears throat> going on with their insurance business that did pose some risks. 
Uh, but you are correct that AIG was, was involved in a number of activities that, that uh, uh, went outside of the traditional uh, insurance area. And outside of the, the, the traditional insurance activities, which really didn't get them in trouble, what, what activities did get AIG in trouble? Well, again, I think it is a complicated question. They had, obviously, a derivatives uh, uh, business that posed a lot of risks, but they were also engaged in, in some activities with um, the capital through their insurance business that posed uh, liquidity challenges. And that was one of the reasons why they couldn't, uh, they had liquidity problems and the Fed had to step in. But even using AIG as, as an example, is, is, is there a, a part of you that, that thinks, again, it is a bit of a stretch to want to lump the insurance industry into, into Dodd-Frank as well? Well, again, I, th I think the regulation of, of large firms that pose a risk to the system is designed to recognize that we can't, we can't achieve our goal by uh, doing that by type of entity or by particular business line today. We have to have the ability to look across the entire financial industry and determine where are the risks coming from and take appropriate action. At the same time, as you have pointed out, we have to make sure that those regulations don't impose unfair burdens on other companies that aren't engaged in those activities. Right. And, and I would, again, I would second that point and just you know, reiterate the fact that, in general, the insurance industry did not at all engage in systemically risky behavior. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Massad, thank you. And thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thank my colleague. Um, in your testimony, on, in the, uh, you, you say outright that Dodd-Frank was necessary because of the moral hazard created, quote, when government provided emergency assistance to private firms. Um, I mean, so you believe that Dodd-Frank answered the too-big-to-fail question uh, Congressman, yes, I believe Dodd Frank gives us the tools to address the too big to fail problem. And so, too big to fail is no longer uh, permissible. Well, Congressman, uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, as I said when you were out of the out of the room, you know, it, it, we have to implement the law. The law is not a magic wand. Uh, it's a bit, as I said, like saying when we passed the Civil Rights Act that didn't eliminate discrimination. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. It's a heck of an analogy. Um, in, to, in today's uh, Financial Times, uh, uh, Alan Greenspan uh, said, "Quote the financial system." Or wrote, I should say, "Quote the financial system on which Dodd Frank is being imposed is for more uh, is far more complex than the lawmakers and even most regulators apparently contemplate." We will almost certainly end up with a number of regulatory inconsistencies whose consequences cannot readily be anticipated. Do you agree? Um, no. I guess what I would say is the question is what, is what are we saying would be the alternative? I don't think anyone would say that we would be better off without the tools that we have now provided for through Dodd-Frank to regulate risk, to impose higher prudential standards, to be able to prevent a firm from, from uh, threatening our entire system. The question is, again, we have to implement those wisely. Are we doing that? I think we are doing that. Okay. Uh, under Dodd-Frank, uh, to continue with Mr. Greenspan's uh, piece in today's Financial Times, under Dodd-Frank, the regulators are being entrusted with forecasting and uh, presumably preventing all undesirable repercussions that might happen to a market when its regulatory conditions are uh, importantly altered. No one has such skill. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I, th I think, again, we have to uh, try. I don't think any of us want to be in a situation that we were in uh, in the fall of 2008, where because we had a regulatory system that had been outgrown. We had a financial industry 
where there was a huge amounts of risk being taken on without transparency, without uh, adequate regulation, and that is what contributed to the crisis we had. I think because of that, we learned the lesson that we need to overhaul our regulatory system. That is the judgment Congress has made, and I think the task is now to implement that judgment. Well, uh, Mr. Borofsky and uh, a number of folks have testified that uh, during the last uh, financial crisis in 2008 that the, the laws that we had then, we could have uh, prevented the crisis. Do you agree? That is news to me. Um, I would be happy to, uh, to discuss that with Mr. Borofsky. Okay. So uh, basically, okay. So it is your view that Dodd-Frank has, has ended too big to fail? As I said, Mr. Chairman, Dodd-Frank gives us the tools to address the problem. Okay. Um, now, moving back to HAMP, and I want to give you an opportunity to respond uh, now in our second round here. Um, you know, you, you made an interesting face when I was saying that, you know, we have 740,000 homeowners who have actively been harmed by this program. Uh, do you disagree? I, I do, sir, and I, I appreciate your So the folks that have fallen out of this program, right, that enter into the program, uh, you know, you tout uh, 1.4 million, is that the number you are? Trial modifications, okay. that is correct. Trial modifications. Yeah. Now, do you understand that when they are entered into a trial modification, they are told verbally that and oftentimes they are going to make a lower monthly payment going forward. Are you aware of that? I am, sir. Okay. Now, in a trial modification that is verbal, as all these are verbal, when you are paying less than what is contractually obligated by a homeowner, that harms your credit. Are you aware of that? Um, Mr. Chairman, are you aware of that? Yes or no? Mr. Chairman, if I can answer how the trial modification works, because I think it is important to have all the facts on the table. The trial modification provides a three-month period in which payments are lowered temporarily, and during that time we have to determine if someone qualifies for a permanent modification. What we did at the outset was we allowed people, we allowed servicers to accept people into trial modifications on the basis of what we call stated income. You could basically raise your hand and say, this is how much I make, I qualify. Because it was a terrible crisis, because we had a lot of people who were in I understand. In need. I read your editorial. The point I am asking, okay, and I know you are you know, trying to go through all this. I understand how this works operationally. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that you understand how this works. So when you are given that verbal modification, this temporary modification, does that hurt your credit? Mr. Chairman, I you're think You are not answering the question. Well, it it either does or it doesn't. If it doesn't hurt your qu uh, credit, I, I, I think the answer can't be given as a simple one without, again, looking at what happens to those people. If I may answer, can I answer the question in this regard, if, you, if you'll allow me? You, you refer to all these 750,000 people being hurt. We actually 740,240, according to your last report. Thank you. We, we actually publish statistics on what happens to those people. Now, those statistics are based on service or surveys, but it's in our monthly report and it shows what happens. The majority of them ended up in alternative modifications or alternative payment plans or are current. Very few of them went to foreclosure. Do you believe that HAMP has harmed any borrower? I am sure there are people who, who were harmed. How many? I, I don't know the answer to that. I thought you published statistics about what happens. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we publish a lot of statistics, and I'm trying my best to address your concern. Uh, I think I think it's important to remember that whenever you implement a program like this on a massive scale in a crisis, what we were doing is buying time for people. Most of those people ended up in better situations. 
there are How many? Are, well, again, based on the servicer surveys, uh, the majority of the vast majority of them were, were clearly in better situations. Only a small number went to foreclosure. But the point even about those is How many went to foreclosure? Uh, about 5 percent. But the point How is many? that What is that number? I don't have the report in front of me. Uh, foreclosure completions is 58,000. But the point is that their loan wasn't increased. They, they owed the same amount. Right. And so when the servicer comes back in, when they are not given a permanent modification, they are owed, they owe those missed payments or the difference between the payment they were making and the payment they were obligated to make. Th that correct. is correct, sir. Right. And there are penalties and fees associated with that, as, as well as additional interest. There, there may be in some right. cases. So, therefore, that temporary modification has left them worse off than had it not been given originally. Sir, if, again, you are talking about a pool of people who are given that breathing room and the majority of them, the vast majority of them, end up being in better situations, I still think it was the right policy judgment to make. Even if this program is actively harming individuals and leaving them worse off? Well, again, it is not that the program is actively harming them, sir. It is that they have a mortgage. They owe the same amount. It should have been explained to them that if they didn't get the permanent modification, they would still owe what was previously due. Okay. Now, if that wasn't explained to them, that was a mistake, but that should have been explained to them. But the program didn't make them worse off. Well, the program, and, and I have got numerous examples from constituents that I could read to you. The, the program has harmed a large number of individuals. And the Treasury Department, you know, the, the Special Inspector General's report on HAMP has been out there for quite a while. You have had plenty of authority to go in and fix this program. You haven't fixed it. Um, and, you know, so you are you're touting some of these statistics. The other thing I just want to make sure to ask why you have this, the survey there or your statistics there, how many, uh, you have you quoted the foreclosure number, how many are in pending foreclosure? Uh, Do you have a statistic uh, similar to that? Foreclosure starts of those not accepted for trial modifications is 163,000. Now, a lot of those could have been in foreclosure starts even before they went into the trial. Okay. Well, look, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond. If you'd like to add anything else, I'd be happy to give you the opportunity right now. I'd be happy to. Again, I think we faced the worst housing crisis of a generation. We were trying to roll out a program that could help a lot of people. A lot of people were already delinquent for months. So we were trying to create some breathing room. Most of those people are in better situations. Those that are not, I think, again, their mortgage didn't increase because of HAMP. They simply weren't accepted into the permanent modification because we have very prudent eligibility criteria so that we spend taxpayer dollars wisely. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Maloney? Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Secretary, Deputy Secretary, if I, could I request to have your, uh, your, your, your op-ed, your editorial, placed in, in the record? And I, I would like to say that uh, Without objection. At meetings with the, the HPD Department in the City of New York, they are very grateful, as are the 35,000 families that were able to stay in their homes because of the HAMP program. I, I would, uh, with all respect, say that it is very easy to throw stones and criticize. It is harder to come up with a program that addressed this crisis, which a large part of it was the housing crisis. And for every person who stayed in their home, not only did it help that person, it helped their community, because vacant homes bring down the, 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 the cost, the, the value of housing for their neighbors. It, it helped their communities, it helped their city, and it helped with the overall financial stability of our country. 
Mark Zandi and other economists have testified that housing is roughly 25 percent of our economy. So if we do not stabilize housing and, and grow in housing, we are not going to stabilize out of this Great Recession. Now, I am very concerned that the Republican majority in the past three weeks have eliminated four critical housing programs that helped people stay in their home. And I would say that it is very, very uh, dishonest to criticize a program for not helping people that had no help to begin with and they didn't get in the program because they did not meet the high criteria that the program had that tax dollars would not be spent unless people had a job, had a credit record, and were believed to be able to meet that commitment going forward. Uh, so I want to congratulate the Treasury Department and really the Obama administration for not just criticizing and saying we have a problem, but getting out there and doing something like FDR. When FDR had a problem, he didn't just look at it, he started working on it. And granted, not every program works, but come in with some ideas of how to make it better. But to come in and criticize a program when you have no ideas of your own, when you haven't come forward with a program, when you haven't done anything to help the people, and I would say the overall economy. Uh, so I want to congratulate you on the work that you've done. I support the HAMP program. I hope that President Obama has a lot of veto ink in his pen, and if the Republican bill gets to his desk, it is my hope that he will veto it. And I respectfully ask the majority if they will have a hearing where we can bring in HPD directors from across the country, people on the front line that were working with our government to help people stay in their home. In the city that I represent, are the officials that do this every day, the not-for-profits that are committed, and the banks that have voluntarily stepped up to the plate to help have said this program works. So instead of just being critical, come up with ways to improve it if you think there's a problem, but to criticize because people didn't get into the program because the criteria was so high, and I, I agree with the pro pro proposal from, from Treasury to keep that a criteria in a way that protects taxpayers' money. Now, I, I would like to move on to the TARP workout. And uh, I, I really want to quote from an article that was written recently, October 20th, uh, 2010, in, in, in Bloomberg. It's one of our uh, big um, papers and, and, and media experts there. And uh, they, they testified, and I'd like your response to this, Honorable Massad. Uh, that TARP investments have actually provided taxpayers with, and I quote, higher returns than yields paid on 30-year Treasury bonds, enough money to fund the Securities and Exchange Commission for the next two decades. The article also states, and I quote, the government has earned $25.2 billion on its investment of $309 billion in banks and insurance companies, an 8.2 percent return over two years. Now, that beat out U.S. Treasuries, high-yield savings accounts, money market funds, and certificates of deposit. Am I correct? Um, Congressman, you are correct that we have had some good returns on the programs. I am not familiar with those exact numbers, but the bank program is making a profit and, and well, some of the well, could other Could I ask, too. could you dis describe generally? the ways in which uh, Treasury is seeking to maximize taxpayers' investment under TARP and ensure that our country and taxpayers are made whole? Cer certainly, Congress Congresswoman. L let me first just say that, obviously, the purpose of TARP was to, to stabilize the system, not, not to make money. But it is, it is terrific that this program will not cost the taxpayers uh, very much, and we are looking to maximize the returns on the various programs. Uh, as I say, we have earned about uh, 20, we estimate we will earn about $20 billion on the bank investments. Uh, AIG right now is at a profit. We will have some loss on the autos. Let me just note one other thing, though, going back to HAMP, because, and I apologize to the Chairman, I, I misquoted the numbers. Uh, in terms of those who were, were in trials and didn't make permanent mods, they are actually about half of what I said. 
the foreclosure completions are only 28,000 and the foreclosure starts are only 84,000. Uh, General gentlelady's time has expired. And uh, with that, I, I gave the gentlelady six minutes, and I will give the ranking member six minutes since I went well over my time. I went out of fairness uh, to all that are here. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll give the ranking member. I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mr. Cummings, six minutes now. Very well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I do want to associate myself with every syllable that Ms. Maloney just said. I, um, I think it's. I think part of the frustrating frustration, Mr. Massad, is, and I think you you're well aware of this. We want even more people to be helped because there's so many people suffering. Absolutely. And I guess the reason for the criteria was the dilemma that people didn't want a program, I mean, the Congress didn't want a program that would, um, would be so, <clears throat> standards would be so low that there would be a lot of people failing. Is that part of the reason? Well, I, I think it's, it's a few things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we did have what we felt were very prudent eligibility criteria. We don't, for example, provide modifications for vacation homes, for vacant homes. We don't provide assistance for those people who can afford their mortgage without it. We don't provide assistance for those who need to move on to another situation. And we make sure that the mortgage, uh, the modification is economically uh, makes sense. And as a result of that, the pool of people that are we currently estimate are eligible, as, as you probably know, is about 1.4 million today. That is the pool of families. We have reached a lot of those. We want to continue to reach more of them. But it is a very difficult problem. Uh, we have had a lot of people looking at whether there are other ways we can do this. Our authority to implement new programs, you know, as you know, has expired. We did take funds and reallocate them to the States so that the States can come up, particularly those States that are hardest hit by these problems, so those States can innovate with some programs that in particular address the needs of the unemployed and uh, the, the problem of falling house prices. Now, do you, um, and early on, much has been made with regard to the whole issue of um, that it was projected by the President that more people would be helped by HAMP than was. Um, did there something, is there something that happened along the way that caused you all to look at this thing and say, wait a minute, maybe we cannot accomplish those numbers that we really wanted to accomplish? And, and if so, what was that? Uh, we recognized that, number one, the eligibility pool wasn't as big as we originally thought it might be. It was very hard to know when the program was launched. Uh, and again, we were in a crisis. People had no sort of historical uh, basis to say, well, you know, this is what, how you should do it. Um, that was number one. Number two was servicers were not equipped to deal with this crisis. Their business model was set up to basically collect payments on performing loans. So it was very, very difficult to implement. We've, we've tried uh, to take a lot of actions to improve that. As we discussed earlier, we need more. We need national servicing standards. There's a lot of work going on on a lot of fronts to address the servicer performance. And number three was it, it, it is hard to reach people sometimes. People don't necessarily want to talk on the phone when they get a call from their mortgage servicer. Uh, they don't even want to hear what it's about. Uh, it was hard to reach people. And so going back to this issue of the trial modification so that we will have a clear picture, so you are saying, and, and this, is, this is a very important point, that a lot of the people who did not end up with permanent modifications were able to resolve their problems in other ways. Is that right? That is that, absolutely true. And it is important to remember that before we launched our program, there were no, there were very, very few modifications getting done by the industry. And those that, many of those that were being done increased people's payments. HAMP set standards that the industry then largely adopted in its proprietary programs, uh, what we call the affordability standard. 
uh, in terms of the ratio of the payment to one's income. And as a result of that, and as a result of other borrower protections we have put in place, HAMP's effect has also been very indirect in terms of improving, you know, helping a lot of people. There have been about 2 million modifications done outside of HAMP since we launched this program. Uh, and I think our standards helped cause that. We have put in, as you know, a number of protections that now the industry is following uh, in terms of prohibitions on dual track, where, where someone who is in the process of being considered for a modification could otherwise be foreclosed upon. Uh, other types of appeal processes for people who are rejected. And, you know, we require the servicers to not only evaluate someone for HAMP, we require them to then look at other types of assistance to make sure that person can't qualify for something else before they are allowed to uh, foreclose upon them. Now, you, um, I don't know whether you have, um, I assume you do have some type of access to information or maybe you are a part of these negotiations with the Attorney General. So are you a part of that? I am not directly. And not uh, you, but, uh, yeah, but you, you have I'm access. Aware, I am aware of what is going on, yes. And I am not trying to get into any confidentiality on the part of those negotiations, but do you, might HAMP be affected by anything that comes out of that? Well, well it, it certainly uh, will be. You know, what is what, going on in that, and uh, again, I appreciate the question. I, as you know, I can't comment on the, on the details of it because it is an enforcement matter. But, but clearly, this is another example of the fact that this industry is broken. It didn't have uh, the standards that we needed and it didn't have the ability to cope with this crisis. And we saw that through HAMP. We saw that through what they were doing on foreclosures, which was outside of HAMP. And I think what is emerging from this is clearly a push to get national servicing standards. And, yes, those, those will have an effect uh, across the whole industry. Uh, and that is what we need. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the ranking member's uh, questions, and especially the last question is of, of interest. Uh, so it, it is a push for uh, national servicing standards. Um, Mr. Chairman, what I said was I think what, what we need, what is evident by what has been found as to foreclosures and what we uh -huh. found as to HAMP is that we do need national servicing standards. Okay. As Thank to you. what comes out of the oh, Go right ahead. I, let, go ahead and finish your sentence. As to what exactly would be in a settlement, I wasn't commenting on that. Oh, okay. That will be determined by the various parties to the settlement. Okay. Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here today. I, um, at this time, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, three uh, uh, written testimonies uh, of uh, what would have been uh, a panel today, a testimony by Joshua Rosner, a testi testimony by uh, the Independent Community Bankers, um, and finally, testimony by Anthony B. Sanders. I ask unanimous consent to be submitted for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Um, today's hearing uh, was certainly interesting. We had two uh, oftentimes dramatically different uh, 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 views of the facts, uh, views of the lay of the land, but certainly uh, stimulating and interesting for us to, to inform Congress's thinking on um, how the implementation of Dodd-Frank is progressing, uh, the impact of the TARP program um, and uh, the bailouts, and whether or not bailouts continue to be uh, uh, the rule of the day. Um, a, a couple of interesting points um, in terms of Mr. Borofsky's testimony. He refers to HAMP as a broken promise as well as uh, it being poorly designed and executed, um, and uh, that the Main Street goals of TARP were not followed through with. Um, and uh, finally, he also uh, testified that uh, uh, what he said was, quote, resolution authority is a joke. Um, and that uh, goes to the heart of uh, uh, really uh, what many of us hear in terms of, of Congress believe uh, is the, one of the lasting impacts of, of Dodd-Frank um, is that uh, we have codified uh, the bailouts um, in terms of calling it resolution authority. 
Uh, now, that was uh, Mr. Borofsky's testimony. Now, uh, Mr. Massa did an able job of defending uh, the administration's actions, in particular uh, HAMP. We simply disagree uh, on the impact it has in terms of those that, are, that it's hurting. I uh, appreciate your testimony and your willingness to be here. Uh, thank you. And uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.